It's another edition of Time About the Movies, and today we're taking a look at the last three films of June 2006, June 30th to be exact. And uh, on this weekend before the 4th of July, we have a new Superman movie, a new movie with Meryl Streep and Anne Hathaway, and a movie adaptation that feels really odd to do, but it's based off of a Comedy Central show. But we'll eventually get to those as we move along here, but let's go ahead and get to the biggest new release of the weekend, which is undoubtedly uh, Brian Singer's Superman Returns. Oh, I can already hear the DC Cinematic fanboys giving me shit for what I'm about to say because, uh, sorry, I don't care. Zack Snyder and Henry Cavill Superman movies pales heavily in comparison to what will always be the best modern-day Superman movie, at least until the James Gunn movie comes out next year. Um, that is Superman Returns, and I know this movie gets a bad rap, but I'm sorry. It's the better Superman movie than Man of Steel. With Man of Steel... Zack Snyder was clearly trying to turn Superman into Batman, and he just isn't. Don't even get me started on Batman v Superman, where Snyder just butchered not only Superman, but also Jar Jar Lex Luthor with Jesse Eisenberg's performance. That's another thing I'm not taking back. Batman v Superman is this generation's Phantom Menace, one of the worst movies from the last decade. What Brian Singer does is bring Superman back to the Christopher Reeve style while also trying to make it stand out and make it his own, like what Tim Burton and Christopher Nolan were able to do with their own style of Batman. Does it work all the way through? No. No, it doesn't. But there was certainly more about it to this movie that I enjoyed than most of what was in Man of Steel. It didn't need to go for a darker tone like Man of Steel did. It doesn't need to go bleak and look so bland like Man of Steel did. And it certainly didn't need to be a boring, long heap of a movie like Man of Steel is, even though Superman Returns does that too, but not as badly. But let's talk about the movie itself. Uh, you have uh, Superman after eliminating General Zod and the other Kryptonian arch-villains, Ursula and Nun. Superman leaves Earth to try to find his former homeworld of Krypton after astronomers have supposedly found it. This movie takes place after the events of Superman 2 and just kind of forgets Superman 3 and 4 exist, which, that's good. Neither one of those movies are great either. When he finds nothing but remains, he returns home to Earth to find out that Lois Lane, played by Kate Bosworth, is engaged to a relative of his boss, the boss being played by Frank Langella, and Lois's fiancé is played by James Marsden, and that Lex Luthor, played by Kevin Spacey, is at it again. After swindling an elderly, terminally ill woman, who was actually played by uh, Noel Neal, the original Lois Lane on the 50s George Reeves show, the psychopathic Luthor who plans to destroy California failed because of Superman's heroics, vowing vengeance against the Man of Steel and contriving a new sinister plot using the crystals of Krypton to build a continent that will wipe out most of North America. Embedded in the continent, the continent's structure is kryptonite, the lethal substance that is on Superman's only weakness. Upon learning of Luthor's sinister scheme, Superman must race against time to stop the psychotic Luthor before millions, possibly billions, are killed. Now, a lot of people are mixed on this movie. A lot of people hate it because it isn't the Superman movie they want to see. It's not really a new rendition like Man of Steel. But it's mostly an homage to the original Superman films by Richard Donner. But honestly, that's not a bad thing. Yeah, it's the same Superman we got from the good old days. But you know what? After all the things they did to him in the third and fourth movie, and especially what, what comes in the, the Zack Snyder movies, which we'll get into that in a little bit, I'm glad that we got a fun, good old-fashioned Superman movie out of this, and that's what I really like about the movie. The casting is one of the biggest sticking points with a lot of people because of their age, but honestly, I thought Brandon Roth did a very good job playing Superman. He keeps the majority of what makes Superman what he is, and he's great in the movie as a title character. I really like him a lot. God got kind of a bad rap after this movie came out because nothing really opened up for him afterwards. He, the, the biggest thing he did after this was Dylan Dog Dead of Night. And he, and, or even Scott, is, I take that back, Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, he was really good in. But um, Kate Bosworth as Lois Lane I thought was very good in the film. The chemistry between her and Ralph works really well. And again, it bears a very res close resemblance to the chemistry that Christopher Reeve and Margot Kidder had in the first two movies. Also, Christopher Reeve was 26 when he came out of Super, ca was, was cast as Superman, and Ralph was 25. So the age difference thing, yeah, that's a bullshit argument. I can go there. You also got good performances by James Marsden as Lois' fiancé. He's not playing a stereotypical douchebag boyfriend that we see in movies like this. He does play a sincere, very caring guy, and he's not stupid either. There's a great scene where he's asking Lois if he still loves Superman. He's playing it very straightforward, and I think it's a good scene. It definitely shows what James Marsden's capable of as an actor as a whole, and we'll see that later on down the road with the movies that he would star in later on. The most seasoned performers, players of the film also handle their parts very well. Frank Langella is great as Perry White, but Kevin Spacey just pitch perfect as Lex Luthor. Say what you will about the guy nowadays, because there's a lot of things you can say about him that are very negative, but 
This guy has two Academy Awards for a reason. He's a hell of a damn good actor. And he's his Lex Luthor captures every aspect of what we come to expect from Lex Luthor. And he makes it his own. He handles it very well. You also have a lot of good supporting performances from people like Sam Huntington as Jimmy Olsen, Parker Posey playing Lex's henchwoman, Miss uh, Tess... Is it Miss Tessmeco in this movie or is it somebody else? It's a different character, even though this is technically based off the Test Master character played by Valerie Perrine in the original 70s Superman movie. So I wasn't too far off, so I'll, I'll, I'll give myself a little bit of credit for that. But, um, you know, Cal Penn has a couple of brief scenes as Lex's henchman. The film utilizes old Marlon Brando clips for some of the scenes where he plays Superman's father, and they're used effectively. They're not just there to just be, like, you know, st just there because of, you know, disportation. They actually do play a part in the storyline in general. I thought a lot of the action sequences and visual sequences were very well done. That one shot where Superman is just listening to people all over the world on the edge of the earth, and it's just this one log tracking shot. That's incredible to look at. That's my favorite scene in the entire movie. Like, there's also those great scenes where, you know, he's he's on top of the building fighting this guy with a gun. And, you know, of course, he has that scene where the gun, he shoots the gun and it goes right for the eye. But, like, his eyes are so, Superman's eyes are so strong that it bends the, destroys the bullet before it can even t hit him. But now, before you think I'm going to go into this movie with all kind of praise, yes, there are a lot of notable flaws to the film. First off, the story. The main problem with the story is that it does start off very strong, basically saying that Superman 3 and 4 doesn't exist anymore, and let's move on. But by that time, by the time the main plot gets halfway through the film, and we find out that they are basically just redoing the same plot from the first movie, I got a little peeved by it, because honestly, I think there could have been a much better story that could have been told without reusing one of the same plots from the previous films. I give the movie credit for trying to add different elements to it than having the instead of including actually having the plan actually happening and you seeing the damage and the cause of the well, the damage of what the Lex's plan was going to do. I think it benefits by adding those scenes, but yeah, it's not a very it's not a very well put together story when it's literally copying elements from the first film. The runtime, yes, it does run three hours long, and while Batman Begins and The Dark Knight can get away with a long runtime and all that. It's because they have a lot of great things going towards them, and they ha keep the audience invested in what's going on. But in this movie, there are a lot of points where the movie could have ended and adds a lot of these pointless scenes that just drag on for no particular reason whatsoever. And the last, the biggest... <clears throat> sorry about that, I had to burp. But the biggest flaw with the film is the, sto the, so the whole secret about Lois' son. There's a whole subplot about Lois's little kid who and who his father really is, which, I mean, if you can't figure it out by that by the time they started it, that you really have to, it's like you really need to examine your head because, good lord, like that's one I like this movie a lot, but when they first introduced this kid and everyone's just like nobody really knows who the father is, it's like really nobody knows who the father is, like. First of all, one of the problems with that kid, this kid is that he doesn't have one word of dialogue in this movie, and he can't speak. Like, guess he has the, I guess he has the same problem as the kid from Scrooge, who couldn't speak after his father died. And two, we know nothing about him because before he has these big scenes in the second half of the movie. So, why are we supposed to care about him? Because he's the little kid in the movie. But like I said before, the biggest thing about this is that what really ticked me off was that. It's the obvious attempts that they try to convince us that this kid is really Superman's kid. There was literally four scenes in the second half where they literally pulled it out of the open, and Lois doesn't even give it a second thought. It's just like, huh, oh, that's weird. Like, like you, just, it would be the equivalent of you know, you know, turning, you know, turning around, you know, turning around and seeing that your house is on fire, and then you're just like, well, that's very peculiar. And then every time you look back on it. That like the, the, the your house is completely like all the way to the ground. It's just like you never put it together. Just, she never puts it together that Superman's kid, and it's just like, come on! Like if I could figure it out right from the get go, that's bad writing right there. And that's just it's just it's one of those things where it's just like yeah, I can understand people being very frustrated with that because I was certainly frustrated with that too. But regardless of all of that, of the two reboots that have come out for the Man of Steel. Superman Returns is, my opinion, the far superior reboot. It has an interesting story that takes place after the first two Superman movies. It's a film that has a good cast that works well with it. Everybody in the story acts like who they're supposed to be. You have a director who knows Superman and clearly has an, ident an idea of what kind of a movie he wants to make with him. The action sequences are great. The music is great. The visuals are impressive. It's a great action film. It's by no means a classic by any means necessary. It has a ton of flaws to it, but... 
it did a better job of bringing Superman back into the mainframe than Man of Steel did. I'm in that minority, but I don't give a shit. Superman Returns is the better reboot, in my opinion. Now, if James, now if James Gunn's a Superman movie that is in production right now. I've been is I mean everything that I'm hearing about it looks really really good. Everything about it has a lot of the same things that I was looking forward to with this movie. James Gunn clearly has an idea of what to do with Superman, and uh, from the early stuff we've seen from it, it looks like it's gonna be that type of a movie that Superman Returns was, except on a ma except probably hopefully on a more mass appreciation level than Superman Returns did. I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what James Gunn brings to the table with it, but until then. This is still the better reboot of the Superman series in, mo in a modern setting. Go at it with me, and uh, yeah, I will be more than happy to take your comment to take your comments down below and uh, constructive criticism, people. Because I, if you're just going to tell, if you're not going to give me any real criticism for the for this, I'm going to delete the comments because I have that power to do that. I mean, I have the power to do it with these hands. But uh, yeah, so yeah, we've wait. I've that's my 10 minute review of Superman Returns. No joke. This review literally has taken me 10 minutes to get into that, but um. With that said, there was another movie that came out this weekend, another big notable release, and that is our next movie. That is Meryl Streep and Anne Hathaway starring in The Devil Wears Prada. This is the movie, of course, that stars Anne Hathaway as a woman who has graduated from a university, landing the dream job that a million girls would kill for. Assistant to Miranda, played by Meryl Streep, the chief editor of Runway, the top-selling fashion magazine in the industry. It's a job set to fast-track her career in journalism if she can survive a year working for Miranda. From here, Andy, with no sense of fashion at all, begins a fish-out-of-water drama as she is thrown into a lifestyle full of the fast-paced, three-inch minimum heel height, Diet Coke, and coffee substance abuse. Andy works really hard with, uh, to deal with Miranda's endless, unimaginable demands. She even becomes trendy and classy. However, she gradually finds herself working 24-7, and soon her life with her boyfriend, played by Vinny Chase from Entourage, with Adrian Grenier, and her best friend Lily is slipping away from her. Then she realizes that she is losing what really matters. She does not want to lose herself, no matter how many more pairs of Manolos and Jimmy Choo she can score along the way. This is kind of a movie that really ushered in Anne Hathaway is the actress that everyone knows her now. Like, everyone looks at her in this movie. It's just like, wow, that girl can really act. Like, the Princess Diary movies were not a fluke by any means necessary. This is a woman that can act and deserve to win an Academy Award, which she eventually did later on with Les Miserables. But not only that, introduction to Emily Blunt. Like, this was the movie that everyone realized, who's this British chick in this movie? She's really good, too. And, of course, Emily Blunt would go on to have a successful career on her own. Pair it up with, you know, Meryl Streep and Stanley Tucci. They will usually turn in 110%. Uh, Adrian Grenier is pretty good in the movie. Simon Baker is pretty good in here as well. The movie itself, I'm not the biggest fan of it per se, but it's the acting that I think really does carry the movie to an echelon where I would say that it's a good movie. I don't like it as much as everybody else does, but I think it's a movie that is mostly working because of the showcase performances by the entire cast, especially the breakout performances by Hathaway and Blunt. I think that's the thing that a lot of people take away from this movie in general. And it works. It works all the way through. Everybody here gives it as all. I'm not a big fan of it per se. I think it has a lot of flaws to it, and it's really not made for me personally, but it's a movie that overall I thought was good. I thought it was okay. I thought it was good. I thought it was an okay movie. I don't like it as much as everybody else does, but I don't hate it either. I just think it's a passable film that work, that really puts itself to another level because of the acting involved in it. And for that, I give it to I give it credit for that. So I like it, don't love it like everybody else does. So let's go ahead and move on to our last movie we have here, which is Strangers with Candy. Yeah, kind of like with the Jimmy Glick movie from a couple years ago, this one kind of overstates its welcome a little bit too, a little bit too early on. Uh, this is, of course, a prequel to the Comedy Central TV series of the same name, where it shows you the origins of uh, Amy Sedaris's character Jerry Blank and how you know she went from a high, she's a 46 year old former high school dropout and self described junkie whore who's released from prison and returns to her childhood home. She discovers her mother has died, her father Guy has been remarried to this woman named Sarah Blank, and she has an arrogant half brother named Derek. And to make matters worse, her father is in a stress-induced coma. Taking the suggestion of the family doctor, literally, Jerry decides to pick her life back up where she left it, beginning her high school all over again as a freshman at Flat Point High. Uh, Jerry joins the science fair team led by Stephen Colbert, the Fig Newtons, along with her new friends, Megawati Sukarnaputri, and uh, 
at <laughs> Tammy Little Nut. Uh, Noblet is not pleased to learn that Principal Ox Onyx Blackman has hired a ringer for the team, Roger Beekman, to ensure the flat point wins, and so Noblet creates a second team. As she struggles to fit in and make her teammates proud, Jerry discovers that through the many though the faces may have changed, the hazards of high school are just the same. Uh, in terms of the show itself, I never really saw it. I mean, I may have seen a couple episodes here and there, but it was never anything I really wanted to get into, per se. Not because not because of the people involved in it. Far from it. I mean, it's produced by David Letterman. You have a cast that includes Stephen Colbert and Amy Sedaris, which, I mean, that's enough alone to get me to get me to go see this right away. You have Dan Hedaya in this movie. Allison Janney is also in here. You have... Um, a cast that also includes Matthew Broderick, Sarah Jessica Parker, Philip Seymour Hoffman, Chris Pratt, Kristen Johnson, Ian Holm. There's a lot of good talent involved in this movie in general, but yeah, I don't know if it's because I'm not the biggest fan of the show, but this character does get kind of old pretty quickly. Maybe in a half hour time restraint, it could work. It works fine, but in a movie, kind of like I said before with the Jimmy Glick movie, like that works for a little bit of time. But if you have to make me watch a whole movie with a character like this, you better have a really, really funny character that can make it work. And here, as much as I like Sedaris in here, I don't think the character really is all that great in general. Plus, there's already been a movie like this that was pretty much this movie blown up for the big screen. That was never been kissed with Drew Barrymore, which I thought was a much better movie than what this film was trying to do. I think this film is... It's not... Uh, here's the thing. It's not a bad movie, but it's just... I don't know. It just feels like... I just kept thinking back to the Jimmy Glick movie. Like, it's one of those things where it's just like, this works for a half-hour show, but if you're trying to just expand this into a movie, you better have something more than just a, a continuation of the TV show. Like, it's an R-rated movie, too. Like, you should be upping the ante in, in terms of what you should be able to accomplish here. I mean, we're going to have another Comedy Central-based ship movie coming up within the next year, Reno 911 Miami, which I think does a better job of expanding the series to a more wider br brand of what you're able to do with the R-rating in general here. Here, not so much. It's I don't know. Like, to me, it didn't work, but I know it has its loyal fans, but for me, it's just a little bit too much for my taste, so... A mixed bag, a mixed opinion on Strangers with Candy. And so, with all that said, we wrap up another edition of Time About the Movies. And the next time we meet, we'll take a look at two more movies, including uh, one of the big sequels everyone was looking forward to, the sequel to Pirates of the Caribbean, Ki Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man's Chest. We also have uh, the Richard Linklater directed A Scanner Darkly. Uh, we'll take a look at both of those movies on the next episode. That'll be coming up tomorrow. Uh, but until then... Thank you so much for watching, and if you want to see more videos like this, please hit the place on the next page, check out the previous episode, and also don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, and notification button so you get updates on when new videos come out because we post here every day on this channel. And don't go too far away because coming up on Time About the Movies Flashback, we're flashing back to October 23rd, 1987 with Prince of Darkness, the latest film from John Carpenter, Suspect starring Sharon Dennis Quaid. The Sicilian and No Man's Land. So we'll take a look at those four movies coming up on Time About the Movies Flashback, which will be coming up right after this. So don't go too far away because we will be right back.